I'm going to need a minute. That was, that was something. Um, man, that's, my, that's just one of my favorite ones, guys. That just gets me. Um, all right, so uh, he's, he's the father of American wit. He's a writer. You've probably read at least one book by him. I'm talking about Mark Twain. Mark Twain's who everybody quotes when we want to sound witty, by the way. A um, couple quotes I want to toss your way. Mark Twain-isms, and tell me if you can't hear the wit here. First off, I love this one. If you are a bibliophile, if you love reading books, here you go. The man who does not read good books has no advantage over the man who cannot read them. Ooh, yeah, see, gives you something to think about. How about this one? So, uh, no offense to you teachers here, um, but there was a point in my... Uh, short career in algebra studies where this was very true of me. I've never let my schooling interfere with my education. Sorry, yeah, it kind of makes you go, yeah. The one that I like the most though, this is my favorite, and it's gonna be where we're going this morning. Here's what he says. The two most important days of your life, the day that you're born and the day that you discover why. Interesting, isn't it? He had this way, this little turn of phrase, right? And if we could sit down this morning and have a conversation, just one-on-one, maybe a cup of coffee in hand over the table, I'd like to ask you about that last one. You know why you're here? Not here in this building or watching online. Do you know why you're here on earth? It has something to do with this idea of satisfaction. Are you satisfied in what God's put in front of you. Are you satisfied in the life that you're actually living? It's the idea of satisfaction, right? Mick Jagger couldn't find it. Snickers promises it. It's this really elusive thing. Satisfaction. Are you satisfied? Well, this is our fourth week in our teaching series called Healthy Habits, and um, it's been a ball to walk with you guys through this so far. Last week, Pastor Micah talked about fasting, and he showed us that fasting is how we keep the gifts that God gives us from turning into God's. Week before that, we looked at prayer. Prayer, we talked about that this is where God makes me who I need to be so I can do what he calls me to do. We started out with the discipline of the word, that we keep God's word close to us because God's word keeps us close to him. And this morning... And we're talking about worship. And I love this because it comes so close to this idea of satisfaction, the reason that we exist. So if you're just joining us, this whole series has been built around one idea. We don't build habits to keep us busy. We build habits to keep us satisfied. What satisfies me? What's worth my affections? What's worth ultimately my life? So this morning, we're going to follow the same format we have the last few weeks. We're going to start by looking at God's word to understand why this habit is so important. And then we're going to talk about, well, how do I build this thing into my life? What do I actually do with it? And so this message, like all the rest, is going to kind of fold into two halves. So this morning, we're going to be in one of the strongest narratives in the Old Testament, one of my favorites. It starts with a tense meeting between a disobedient king named Ahab and a very forthright prophet named Elijah. And then it crescendos into this powerful picture of worship. And when the dust finally settles, the story teaches us one eternal truth about worship, and here it is. Worship is the declaration of my satisfaction in God. Worship is the declaration of my satisfaction in God. So before we get into the text, I want to back up and just kind of frame it a little bit for us. So if you know the Old Testament, you know that the books of First and Second Kings, we're going to be in First Kings chapter 18, by the way. So if you want to turn there, you can, or you can follow along on the screen. The books of First and Second Kings tell the story of 40 kings who have ruled over God's people. This morning, we're going to look at one of them, this guy named Ahab. Now, you need to know that Ahab has a bit of an obedience problem. Ahab and God are not getting along. Ahab marries a pagan princess named Jezebel and then builds an altar to her god named Baal. Back in chapter 16, 1 Kings actually says that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than any other king before him. Not a good dude. 
So in Ahab's first year on the throne, God sends the prophet Elijah to him, and as his first prophetic assignment, Elijah has to come to the king and say that because of his wickedness, God's going to bring a drought on the land. I'm sure that made a great first impression. King, great to meet you. By the way, because of your wickedness, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. From that meeting to our text this morning, it's been three and a half years. Years. Three and a half years, no rain. The rivers, streams, barren. Every well, bone dry, not a drop anywhere. And that brings us to 1 Kings 18, verse 17. You can follow along with me. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have. You and your father's house, because you've abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. So in the ancient world, and certainly in an arid climate, like Israel, water was a precious commodity. If your kingdom had ready access to water or it was placed on a fertile delta like northern Egypt, you would control the means of the production. You were an economic and political powerhouse. You were the big dog on the porch. Ancient kingdoms fought over water rights like modern countries fight over oil rights. If, however, you depended on rain for your crops, like Israel... And you didn't have the luxury of wells and streams. You were at the mercy of the weather. This was such a big deal that the ancient people actually fashioned a god of the rain to make sure everything was okay. And you had to keep this god happy because if you didn't, no rain. Take a wild guess what Baal is supposedly the god of. Rain. Three and a half years, not a drop. And so God sends Elijah to clarify a few things for Ahab. And did you catch how Ahab addresses Elijah here? What's he call him? Did you see it? He says, is this you, you troubler of Israel? That's an important point for us to remember, even this early in the story. The only way God deals with hardened hearts is to speak his truth in uncomfortable ways. And the only reason it's uncomfortable is because we don't want to hear it. (laughs) Sometimes truth speakers sound a lot like troublemakers when our hearts are hard. So this contest has been three and a half years in the making. You think God's ready to show up in a powerful way? So the people gather. Take a look in verse 21. Elijah asks them an incredibly short but pointed question. Here's what he says. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And then, then take a look at this reaction. And the people did not answer him a word. Isn't that last phrase just penetrating? The message interpretation of the Bible puts it this way. It says, nobody said a word, nobody made a move. It wasn't that the people were against God. They may have a use for him sometime later, but what they have done at this point in their history is they've taken like a little bit of God, a little bit of Baal, a little bit of Asherah, tried to mix it all up until like a you can have it your way spirituality. And Elijah says, hey, we're done with that. (laughs) How long will you go limping between two opinions? Your loyalties must be on one side of the fence. You only get one option. You can only worship one thing. Your knees can only bow at one altar. Your hope can only rest in one God. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is, follow him. He's just saying, guys, let's just be consistent in our theology. Same words for us today, I think. If your faith is in insert idol here, just say it and be done with it. Sobering words for us to consider, right? I don't think I need to tell you this, but in case you're wondering, there are endless bales living and kicking today. 
He has a thousand faces and a thousand names. An idol is an idol. Every one of them promises you something. Every one of them is powerless to deliver. But at this point in the story, especially if you know the story, don't you want to like reach through the pages and like grab the people and go, somebody speak up, somebody say something. You're the people of God. You've seen him. How can you be such spiritual sissies? Come on, speak up. But Elijah does what godly men and women have done across time. He puts himself in an unpopular, uncomfortable, and and unenviable position of trusting in God and God alone. Take a look in verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left as a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men, not good odds, according to the world. Let two bulls be given to us. And let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it into pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. Then I'll prepare the other bowl, lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. You call on the name of your God, I'll call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Elijah explains the nature of this little contest, and by setting them as two separate events... He's making sure there's no confusion. Like, they're not both going to burn up. You can be sure of that, because that's the issue. It's this or this, little piece of cultural insight for you. It's likely the people agreed so readily, because in addition to being the god of rain, Baal is also the god of lightning. So they're looking at this going, well, fire from heaven? Like, of course Baal can do that. That's kind of his signature move. (laughs) We're not worried about this. Verse 25. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves a bull, prepare it first. For you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire to it. They took the bull that was given to them, and they prepared it. And they called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. There's no voice, and no one answered And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them. If you don't think sarcasm is in the Bible, check this part out. He says, cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself. And that's exactly what you think it means. Or maybe he's on a journey or he's asleep or he must be awakened. And they cried aloud and they cut themselves after the manner, after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. That's the sacrifice. And there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. This scene is horrifying. Richard Patterson describes it like this. It says, The prophets of Baal became more and more frantic. In renewed frenzy, they lacerated themselves with swords and spears, the blood flowing freely down their perspiration-soaked bodies. The ritual went on and on at an increasingly feverish pitch. As the time for the evening sacrifice came, there was still no response. Kind of crazy the lengths to which people will go to defend an idol, isn't it? They'll lose friends, they'll lose sleep, they'll lose hope. A few quick things we need to see here. First, Elijah lets them go first, which is a real sign of his faith. Because if something did happen, this is awkward. But he lets them go first because he knows nothing's going to happen. And then the second thing I want you to see here is how he taunts them, these things that he says to them. He's actually contrasting what Baal is supposed to be with the God of the Bible. He uses attributes of God. First thing he says is, can he hear you? Versus God's attentiveness, Psalm 34, 17. When the righteous cry, God hears. (laughs) Is he gone? Versus God's omnipresence. Even there your hand will hold me fast, Psalm 139. Is he asleep? Versus God's watchfulness. The Holy One of Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So what's he doing here? He's not just being sarcastic, he's being theological. He's taking the attributes of God that the people should have known and he's throwing it right back in their faces going, don't you forget who your God is. Don't you forget what he's capable of doing. Last thing I want you to see though is at the end of verse 29, no voice, 
No one answered. No one paid attention. Sound familiar? Didn't we just read that back in verse 21? Baal's silence aligns with the people's silence. And Elijah's the only one who has any clue what's about to happen. But now, here's where things get good. So these 450 prophets of Baal, the glint of their ceremonial knives dulled with blood, these wild, ambitious eyes now dulled with blood loss and self-laceration. They come down the mountain like a defeated army. And now look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me, which is his way of saying, I don't want you to miss this. <laughs> all the people came near to him. He repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seahs of sea. That's almost, well, gallons of water. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood. So, so far, everything's the same. Then he said, fill four jars with water and put it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Strange. Then he said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time, they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. Why? That this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. So Elijah walks step by step up to the altar. And rather than invoking a right or doing some terrible act of self-mutilation, Elijah just prays. It's quite a word for those of us who want revival, isn't it? So what did God think of Elijah's prayer? Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. It wasn't enough that God took care of the sacrifice. That would have been enough. That was the rules. But then don't you love how God does that stuff? I'm not going to just do that. I'm going to take care of the wood and the stones. I'm going to lick up the water that's in the trench. This is our God. Worship is the declaration of my satisfaction in God. But now we get to my favorite part of the story. Last little bit. Verse 41 Take a look at this. Elijah said to Ahab, this has been really, really good. Go back to the king and be like, okay, <clears throat> chapter two. Go up, eat, and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. Skip down a couple of verses, verse 45. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. That's the end of the story. I've been reading the story wrong for years. I always thought it was when like the fire fell. I'm like that was the end of it. No, 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 no. If worship is the declaration of my satisfaction in God, look at what he does. Three and a half years, not a drop. And there's a cloud off on the horizon and then another and then another and then it's thick with rain. This is our God. Before we talk about what this means for us, we think about worship. I want you to imagine something with me. So God's people have lived in the promised land for 450 years at this point. 450 years is a long time. And they've drifted. Imagine if you could go back, maybe to Moses, and say, Moses, all that unity that you saw in your people when they ran out of Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. 
If you could go back to Joshua and say, Joshua, all the courage that your people showed when they hunkered down in the word and moved forward despite overwhelming odds. Or you could go to David and be like, David, all your leadership, like this heart of worship that you recovered for your people, you can go back and tell all of them, and they're right back to where they started. Everything you fought for, everything you worked for, everything you believed in, everything you've called the people to, all of that, they're right back to where they started. This is every leader's worst nightmare. Here's the sobering point, and I want to use this as a hinge to go where we need to go. It isn't the high points that turn your heart. It's the slow drift, the delicate fade the subtle creep, imperceptible but real, barely noticeable but devastating, invisible but damaging. Idolatry is the gradual blur that changes you from a promised land people to a people far from the heart of God and you don't even know it. And I want something better for you. And I can see it creeping in, even in my own life, I can see it creeping in from the edges. What would it look like to time lapse that 450 year slice of Israel's history and to watch idolatry unfold? To watch this all blur and become nothing? If worship is the declaration of my satisfaction in God, how does that get so twisted? So in thinking how to approach this issue for us practically today, I want to give you four ways that you can solidify your satisfaction in Christ because I don't believe that idolatry is staved off by doing this. (laughs) Worship is about cultivating satisfaction in Christ and so that's where I want to go. So four ways. We are just as vulnerable as the people are here. First way, get serious about sin. Get serious about sin. I want revival just like you guys do. Not just in like my neighborhood, you know, or my family or my church, or our city and our country. I want revival just like you guys do. But you know where revival starts? It's not in stadiums and it's not on marches. Revival starts right here. When I confront the idols in my own heart, and every prayer is the seed of revival. We gotta get serious about our sin. The people's biggest problem is they didn't think that they had one, right? They didn't think anything was wrong with this picture. So how do we wanna understand sin? I wanna give you four descriptions, four words that God's word uses to describe sin in our lives. And this may help you. We're gonna go here again in a couple of weeks. We're gonna be talking about a series that's gonna deal a lot with spiritual warfare. Uh, But we're gonna give you a little bit of a teaser on it right now because it shows up here. The first word that God's word uses to describe sin is temptations. And it's kind of this outer ring, temptations. Temptations are these areas of sin that are really common, right? Temptation itself isn't sin, but is the soil in which sin sprouts. But then moving inward from temptations, we have struggles. Struggles are these areas where I find myself routinely battling against the same kind of sin, right? And you have these in your life. These are things that like, oh, they just seem to come around a lot. They're just nagging. It's this fight that's here and it can be exhausting. Then after struggles, we have footholds. Footholds are where things kind of turn. Footholds are where kind of the enemy has his foot in the door of my life in some area. This could be an addiction, This could be something that is just like, I just cannot get over this in my life. Satan has a foothold. But then this last area of sin is a stronghold. This is where things get really, really serious. This is a full-blown addiction, an obsession, something you cannot stop thinking about, something you've completely given your heart over. Here's why strongholds are so serious. It's because strongholds fracture relationships and they pull you away from the heart of God. And these four areas, they all kind of collapse into each other. Now, here's why I bring all of this up. By the time we get to 1 Kings 18, God's people had fallen all the way from temptation to struggle, to foothold, to stronghold. They weren't like tempted to worship Baal. It wasn't just hanging out here somewhere. It wasn't just something they were struggling. They hadn't really fought in a long time. There wasn't a foothold. Like it was full-blown stronghold. 
So how do you get serious about sin, especially in these four areas? A couple of things. First, fight temptation early. I know that sounds like second grade Sunday school, guys, but it's so true. Your second grade Sunday school teacher was right. You got to fight temptation early. It's real, it's strong, and if you don't stop it in the early stages, it can wreck you. Another way, ask for help. Ask for help. If you find yourself going in on these circles, you got to ask for help. I'll give you the one game changer when it comes to dealing with sin in your life, humility. Say, I can't do this on my own. I need some help. Third way you can get serious about sin. This is where the church matters. Commit yourself to bearing burdens with other people. This is what church is. This is not where we come because we're perfect. This is where we come because we need to be made more like Jesus. And I need you and you need me and we need to be around each other to do this. This is where we bear each other's burdens. Not only can you do this, but you must do this. It's not an option. It's what we're called to do. So that's number one. Number one way to get or to uh, be satisfied in Christ is to get serious about sin. Number two, don't settle. You want to solidify your satisfaction in Christ, don't settle. Here's the thing. Israel didn't turn to Baal just because they started liking statues. I think we need to get in this for a minute. Like, it wasn't that they just saw a pretty statue and they're like, oh, we'll go with that. They got there because they got scared. They hadn't seen water in three years. They got scared and then they got nervous and then all of a sudden God wasn't enough anymore. And so their theology became this stew of gods all thrown into the same pot and ended up tasting terrible. And that's what they settled for. Don't do that. That's what's heartbreaking. And I know some of you think I'm overstating this, but we do this every day. We settle for these paltry things. But this is the way idols work. Okay? Idols attach themselves to a very real, raw emotion, and then they work inward. They seep into your heart. Fear, sadness, all these emotions we feel on the surface. The idol attacks that thing and then goes in. And before long, we feel very justified living in sin. That's where the people got, or that's where, how they got where they are. For the alcoholic, here's how it sounds. My drink is important to me because it levels me out. I can't function without it. For the porn addict, this makes me feel needed. It makes me feel desired. It makes me feel wanted. For the greedy, I need my money because it makes me feel like I've got control. I've got power. And if I give it away, I won't have those things. All of those idols have one thing in common. They say, Jesus is not enough. It's idle language. They just say Jesus isn't enough. They just say it in different ways. Jesus, I need something now and you can't give it to me. You feeling invalidated in your marriage? There's an idol for this. Here you go. Feeling angry about the way our country's going? Solution, hate the other side. (laughs) Feel frosty about that comment or that little thing, that post? Great, don't turn the other cheek. You don't have to do that anymore. It's time. All idols say is Jesus isn't enough. Here's the test. How long do you find yourself saying, yeah, but? Sounds like this. I know Jesus said, love your enemies. Yeah, but he didn't mean those enemies. (laughs) How about this one? I know God has a plan. Yeah, but sometimes you got to take matters into your own hands. I know God says this, yeah, but there comes a time. All yeah, but says to a watching world is there are some things Jesus is good for, but the rest of it's on me. And if this whole scene with Elijah teaches us anything, it's that God does not want yeah, but people. Either you follow him or you don't. Either you trust him or you don't. Either he's gonna bring rain or he won't. Either he satisfies you or he doesn't. So how do you gospel your heart against settling? I wish we could sit down and like talk about this together. Because I know you feel sad. I know you feel mad. I know you feel frustrated. I know you feel scared. I know you feel those things because I feel those things. 
But those feelings can drive us to a point where we pin our hopes on a political outcome, a stimulus check, or whatever. Something out here. I don't want that for you. I want you to be satisfied. I don't want you to settle. So hear me on this one. You are worth more than your idols will ever give you credit for. You are meant for relationship with the God of the universe who can give you the peace that your soul is craving to be with him. You are meant for that. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Don't let your happiness depend on something that you might lose. What does that mean? It means we should tether our hope and our joy and our satisfaction to the one person who is constant. Tell me our broken, changing, circus of a world doesn't need to know the changeless Christ. Here's what Jesus said. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, you trust in me. He says, come, you who are weary, you're bogged down, you're heavy laden, I will give you rest. You hear what Jesus is doing? He's inviting us to pin the full emotional weight of our pain and our sorrows and our sadness, all of our hopes, our joys, our exaltations, everything, pin it all on him. What's that take? First off, I think it takes honesty. My biggest idol isn't Baal, it's Brannon. I think I can fix it all. I think I can satisfy it. I can engineer my life in such a way that I'll be happy. Some of you have tried that one. How's it working? Doesn't. I think it also takes faith, doesn't it? Because praying for your enemies doesn't make any sense. Loving those who persecute you doesn't make any sense. And so at some point, I've got to take a spot. I'm going to go, okay, God, I'm going to take you at your word because I believe you. Biblical worship is just saying one thing. Jesus satisfies me, even when I don't understand it. Worship is the declaration of my satisfaction in God, and I'm not settling. Third way, you can solidify your satisfaction in Jesus. Keep the main thing the main thing. Here's another idol tactic. Idols want to reduce mountains into molehills, and they want to build molehills into mountains. Idols love this stuff. Back to 1 Kings 18. Do you know what Ahab is doing right before this whole showdown? Dead serious. If you went back and read the chapter before, you know what he's doing? He's debating about the best place for his horses to graze. I'm serious. Like, talk about, like, missing the point. You're like, man, well, maybe if you solved the real issue, this thing would take care of itself. (laughs) Matt Smithhurst puts it this way, and I love it. I just want to read this comment to you. Because this is a theological issue. Here's what he says. Theological liberals treat black and white issues as if they're gray. Legalists treat gray issues as if they're black and white. Mature Christians, gladly submitted to God's word in a healthy church, do the harder work of holding truth's intention and resisting easy extremes. That is a power-packed statement. Extremes are easy. Here's why this matters for our world right now and why we must address this in the church. Our cultural landscape is littered with molehills. Everywhere. Little things that in the grand scheme don't matter. They feel like they do, but they don't. And molehills divide churches and molehills distract Christians and molehills kill mission. Worship style used to be the thing. Now it's masks. Tomorrow it'll be something else. And my word for you is this. Please do not give the enemy the satisfaction of making your molehills into mountains. So how do you do that? How do you keep the main thing the main thing? Quick tip on this one. As you read the New Testament, especially the Gospels, ask yourself, what does Jesus care about? Who does Jesus defend? What makes a big deal to Jesus? If you're a Christian, that's your playbook. 
We align our lives to what he does and we follow him. We are followers of Christ, so we do what he does because we learn to care about the things that he cares about. And if you read your Bible with that in mind, two things will jump out to you. One, you'll be surprised about the things that I care about a lot that Jesus never mentions. And then I'll be surprised about the things that he does that I never think about. Let's just make this super timely and uncomfortable for just a second. Can we? If you're in the room or you're watching online this morning, you'd call yourself a political conservative. You know who you might need in your life? A liberal. What? Are they even Christians? Yeah, some of them are. If you're here and you're a political liberal this morning, you know who you might need in your life? A conservative. What? They're all racists. No, they're not. They're good people who are trying to do what they think is best to honor God. Now, why would we do that? Just to create some imaginary middle ground where nothing else matters? No. We do that so we can recognize our molehills for what they are, gospel our hearts against them, and learn the sufficiency of Jesus. Every idol, here's another tactic for you. Every idol asks you to give up something precious to defend it. In the last year, I've seen so many Christians give up valuable opportunities for the kingdom so they can defend a molehill. And it's sad. Both sides of the aisle, by the way. Imagine a room, like an actual living room, maybe in your house. Imagine a room full of people with nothing in common but Jesus. Sounds a lot like the early church, doesn't it? And I know, in the back of your head, you're going, well, how would that even work? That sounds like some impossible, idealistic, starry-eyed, naive utopia. What would we even talk about? I don't know, try Jesus. A lot more satisfying. It's a lot more fun. It's a lot more refreshing. Our world needs to see Christians who say with their lives over and over again, Jesus satisfies me, period. And we are so in love with who he is, so compelled by what he's done for us and doing in us, so on fire for his mission and his purposes that we joyfully, willingly, eagerly surrender all these other things to keep the main thing the main thing. Fourth and final way to solidify your satisfaction in Jesus, ask What is worth my life? Sounds like a morbid, maybe heavy question. But here's the idea. Worship, by now, you know this isn't just about music. Worship is about building my life around what matters most. It's the declaration of my satisfaction in God. And that declaration is not in the words that I sing, but it's in the life that I live. What's worth your worship? What's worth your life? This is the issue. It's either going to be God or everything else. (laughs) This is the issue that you must answer, and you must answer for yourself. No one can make this decision for you. Don't get distracted from it. Don't put it off. This is the critical issue. What is worth your life? Find out what that is, and then live for it. Something that is worth considering We are always sharing our faith. We're always sharing our faith. Every day, whether you evangelize or go out and do that thing or not, you're always sharing your faith. You can't turn it off. It's not a light switch. Your life, by the way you live, demonstrates what is valuable to you and what is worth something to you. You're always saying it, and people are always watching. I think Elijah got this. Elijah figured out what he was willing to die for, and then he lived for it. The Apostle Paul's the same way. In Acts chapter 20, there's this great little slice into Paul's life where he says, I don't count my life as valuable or as precious to myself. What a countercultural statement. And then he says, if only I may finish what I've received from the Lord Jesus. And you're like, well, what is that? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, my life is about one idea. Everything else is garbage. Now, what does that mean for us, though? Does that mean that you need to quit your job and head out into the mission field? Maybe. Probably not. But maybe. For some of you, it does. I think for most people, though, building your life around what matters most to you means taking the everyday rhythms and spaces of your life and bringing Jesus there. If you're a stay-at-home parent... Use your day to pray for your kids while they're at school. And then when they get home, show them Jesus. If you're a contractor, let your job site be the place where you make much of Jesus in your conversations. If you're a teacher, 
Your classroom is your cathedral. Let the way that you talk with kids and interact with them affirm their dignity, that they are image bearers of Almighty God. That's how you make much of Jesus every day to everyone. It's a practical step on this one. You want to know what's worth your life? First, you've got to figure out what you're actually about. A couple tips. If you're a parent, ask your kids what they think your life is about. I did this this weekend. I asked Hannah. She's our 11-year-old. Today, it's her birthday. I said, Hannah, if daddy's book, or if daddy's life was a book, what would the title be? I'm not going to give you the answer. <laughs> it was indicting. <laughs> Ask people what your life is really about and then listen to them. Or another thing you can do, take a look at your social feeds. Social is the brand of you. What's your Facebook page say about you? If people had to conclude what Jesus mattered to you based on what you do, what would they conclude about Jesus? What do you post? What do you share? How do you interact? That matters. Another way you can figure out what your life is about is figure out what makes you mad, what makes you sad, what gives you hope. Do a little self-reflection here and say, what really trips my wire? It's a good indication to where your heart is. Your emotions are just signals for your loyalties. So ask yourself what you're willing to die for and then live for that. Worship is the declaration of my satisfaction in God. So here's where we're gonna go. Um, I know this has been a heavy one. And um, I was telling some of our staff this week, I wrote like three sermons in preparation for today. And this one's the heaviest out of all three. So what we want to do is we want to create a space here for a little bit just to do business with God. Some of you in this room, you're Christians, and some of you watching online, you've committed to follow Jesus, but you've got some work to do. Maybe there's some idols that he's bringing up in my own life where I go, I got to give these things over. I I just got to release them. I got to surrender this. Some of you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus yet, and you're on that fence. You're going, am I on this side of that mountain, or am I on this side of that mountain? Don't wait to make that decision. You can do that today. (laughs) Saying, God, I'm a sinner, and I need you, and I accept Jesus and the cross. Everything that I needed, he did. So we're going to take a couple of minutes. There's going to be some questions on the screen, and Micah and Nikki are going to play and sing. I just want to have a couple minutes in quiet with the lights a little bit lower. Just pray, do some business with God, and then I'll come up after a few moments, and I'll close this back out.